While Ataturk and Reza Shah were transforming Turkey and Persia in the 1920s, over in Arabia, the Saudis would finally unite their country after nearly 100 years of trying. As their Wahhabi ideology spread around the peninsula, in 1920, the Ikhwan rose up in Aba, the capital of the new Upper Asiya Emirate. These Ikhwan were Islamists that quickly swore allegiance to the Saudis, bringing their rule further south. To the north of them, there was also Jabal Shamar, which had long kept the Saudis at bay. But in 1920, Saud ibn Rashid was killed by his own cousin. This led to further divisions within the state, and the new rulers soon had to face Ibn Saud's men. Jabal Shamar, as an old Ottoman ally, was also left somewhat alone in this new world. While the Saudis had, temporarily, worked alongside the British and received modern weapons from Kuwait. On Kuwait, though, their old ambitious leader Mubarak had died, so the Saudis had no real contenders for dominance up in the north. Also, it should be said that the Saudis and Kuwaitis had huge ideological differences. As one foreigner remarked, the Sunni people of Kuwait are tolerant to others and not over rigid to themselves. Wahhabism is carefully prescribed. All efforts of Najd have never succeeded in making one single proselyte at Kuwait. As such, the Ikhwan tried to attack Kuwait a couple times in 1920, but they couldn't break through their defenses at the Red Fort. So Ibn Saud turned all of his attention over to Jabal Shamar, where his Wahhabi clerics had been gathering support. This was also around the same time that the great powers were meeting to divide most of the Middle East between the family of the Sharif of Mecca. Ibn Saud therefore realized he needed to act fast in order to stop some degree of encirclement. In November 1921, he struck at Ha'il, took over the city and all of Jabal Shamar. To the north of them now lay the Ruwala tribe, led by Nuri al-Shalan. He joined the Arab revolt but his allegiances often changed afterwards, sometimes helping Abdullah in Jordan or even the French in Syria. Well, his tribe would stretch to cross the modern borders, lost control of Al Jawaf to the Saudis as well. The Saudis then continued as the Ikhwan launched raids into Iraq in late 1921 and massacred many of the Shia inhabitants. They then moved on to Transjordan, where they met with the Bani Taqiyya tribe, who halted their advance. Two years later, over 4,000 Ikhwan troops would come again, and this time they came very close to a man. The British Air Force, however, stepped in and bombed their position to drive them back. Remember, though, that this was the Ikhwan, not Ibn Saud, who, like the British, wanted to avoid a war. So the two sides met at Al Muammara to set the new Iraqi borders. However, Ibn Saud presented a major issue. That was trying to place European-style borders around nomads. Instead, they agreed to designate control over tribes to each other. Like the Dafia, the Yanaza, and Muntafiq were classed as Iraqi tribes, while the Shamar were Saudis now. As negotiations stalled, HRP Dixon reported that Percy Cox lost all patience over what he called the childish attitude of Ibn Saud in his tribal boundary idea. Ibn Saud almost broke down and pathetically remarked that Sir Percy was his father and mother and who had made him, and that he would surrender half his kingdom, nay the whole world, if Sir Percy ordered. So Cox was free to define the borders, guarding Kuwait and Iraq. Although these countries were now home to many Shamar refugees, but they were still technically under Saudi control. Some of them even launched raids back across the border, so discussions therefore continued until 1924. And so too did the cross-border raids. Like Faisal al-Dawish, the leader of the Ikhwan, took troops into Iraq, and the Saudis placed an embargo on Kuwait, hoping to break them. There were some agreements made though, like they created small neutral zones between their countries which existed for decades. By now though, the Saudis became far more focused on taking Mecca. The British still, in theory, supported the Sharif of Mecca, but by this time he was old and had few allies. Many in the Islamic world viewed him as a traitor, and as he refused to sign the Treaty of Versailles, the Allies began to move away from him as well. While within his own country, he made many people unhappy and often refused to listen to his advisors. His demise finally came in 1924 when he declared himself Caliph, wrongfully believing that the Muslim world would unite behind him. He also decided to ban Saudi pilgrims from visiting the holy cities, finally giving Ibn Saud a cause for war. In August, they took Taif, and then in December, Mecca surrendered without much of a fight. The Sharif, realizing the situation, abdicated in favor of his son Ali, and he tried to get support from the British. But it was all too late. 
Ibn Saud invited Muslims from around the world to a congress recognizing his rule over Mecca, and he took the title the King of Hejaz. Some foreigners celebrated this achievement, like St. John Philby, a Muslim convert and future Nazi sympathizer. He was a keen supporter of Ibn Saud, who helped to map out the unexplored lands of the empty quarter and facilitate deals with oil companies. Philby even met with David Ben-Gurion to discuss the possibility of creating a refuge for Jews within a Saudi-led Arab federation. And off topic, but his son Kim Philby was part of the Cambridge Five that spied for the Soviet Union. Back in Arabia though, in the south, Muhammad ibn Ali al-Idrisi had created the Emirate of Asiya back in 1908. Trapped between Yemen and the Hashemites of Mecca, he formed alliances to maintain his independence, and for a while he even managed to push the Yemenis back to al hudaydah But he died in 1923 and the Yemenis retook their land. Fearing more attacks, they made a deal with Ibn Saud in 1926, becoming a protectorate. Further south still, the British in Aden were beginning to grow more wary of Yemen and the possibility of local tribes switching their allegiances. So whenever there were Zaidi incursions into their lands, they'd respond swiftly with their air force and bomb areas. And the often local troops would go on what were called flag marches to demonstrate British power in the region. The British Air Force would again have to be used in the north of Arabia as the Ikhwan raided Iraq and Kuwait again in 1927. This though was in direct violation of the Treaty of Jeddah signed that year. This treaty recognized Ibn Saud as the legitimate ruler, but in return he had to stop attacks on British protectorates. But the Ikhwan refused to accept this. Their group largely consisted of tribes like the Otaibar, the Mutayya, and the Ajman, and some like the Ajman had previously fought against the Saudis, while the Oitaba under Sultan bin Bajad had caused issues before. Like in 1925, they attacked Egyptian pilgrims who played music in Eshin. These tribesmen, though now pushing into Iraq and Kuwait, had taken over a police station and killed an American missionary. All of this was in clear defiance of Ibn Saud, who finally decided to act in 1929. At Sabila, he crushed them using machine guns in less than an hour, and with the rebellion crushed, the kingdoms of Najd and Hejaz were united into the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. However, the descendants of the Sultan of Oitaba would continue to challenge the Saudis, infamously seizing control of the Grand Mosque of Mecca decades later. Otherwise, there were still some small states outside Saudi control, like the small principality of Narjan. They had refused to participate in Yemen's war for independence from the Ottomans, and had remained in a state of limbo since the fall of the Ottoman Empire. In 1924, Yemen failed to conquer it, and later, Yemen and Saudi Arabia would clash here. However, like with Upper Asiya, very little information, at least in English, exists on this state. Yemen, by the way, at this point was still led by Imin Yahya. He also began to modernize the state somewhat and kept old Ottoman officials in the country to help with this job. He did still maintain claims to British Aden, but he knew he needed allies. So he signed a treaty with Mussolini in 1926. The Italians had actually been looking at expanding into Arabia for some time now, something the British would not allow. As one British official wrote in 1915, were Italy to get a footing along the Red Sea Arabian littoral, her role as an arbiter in Islamic matters would be unquestioned. They feared the Italians could control the Red Sea and thus the Suez. The Italians though had continued sending aid to the Idrisi for some time now, and as the British Foreign Office said, it was on account of the danger from Italian aspirations that we hoisted our flag nearly a year ago on some of the islands of the Red Sea. When Idrisi fell under Saudi control, the Italians just redirected their aid towards Yemen and signed the Treaty of Friendship. In the eyes of the British, this threatened Aden especially as their rule in southern Yemen remained volatile. They had, after all, around 1,400 treaties with the various leaders of many different states. But as of yet, no real threats came. British rule or influence elsewhere was also pretty safe, like in Abu Dhabi, where the ruling family had been busy fighting each other. Like Hamdan bin Zayed bin Khalifa al Nayyan was assassinated in 1922 by his own brother Sultan. He then took over the throne as familial factions developed and some fled abroad. That was until he was killed by another brother known as Sakhir, and he in turn was killed in 1928. His nephew Sakbut bin Sultan al Nayyan would rule next, finally stabilizing the leadership 
until the 1960s. Dubai was more stable under the control of Saeed bin Maktoum, who ruled from 1912 to 1958. He helped turn the city into a commercial centre based on pearl diving, welcoming in traders and migrants from around the world. As such, he was pretty content with British protection. However, the Japanese developed the cultured pearl, which could be produced commercially, and, along with the Great Depression, this crippled the industry. Bahrain was also pretty stable, having been ruled by Isa bin Ali al Khalifa since 1869, the longest reigning ruler of the country. However, he was a despotic ruler. The British had long commented on his treatment of the local Shias. Like in 1878, Captain Edward Lord Duran described them as a broken spirited, helpless lot, and there were innumerable complaints of the tyranny of the sheikhs and their tribe. Or more recently, in 1921, Major Clive Kirkpatrick said, Instances of this oppression are far too numerous to quote. Oppression in the past two years has been amounted to terrorism. Because of these crimes, the British technically forced him to abdicate in 1923, but most do not consider this as legitimate. Nearby in Qatar, Abdullah bin Jassim Al Thani, who had signed the original Treaty of Protection with the British, continued to rule until 1949. And then there was Taimiyah bin Faisal, who ruled in Oman under British influence. Crucially though, this whole region still depended on slavery. Back in 1880, 10,000 out of the 36,000 people that lived in the Emirates were slaves. And even in the 1930s, they still had 7,000 slaves, primarily working in the pearl trading business. In some instances, a slave could hold high positions, like in Kalba in 1937, they would appoint an African slave to be the regent of the sheikdom until his owner came of age. Each country also bought slaves from different regions. Like in the 1930s in Qatar, there were 6,500 slaves out of a population of 27,000 people, and most of these slaves were African. Kuwait, on the other hand, only had a couple thousand slaves in the 1920s, and some of them were Armenians, Yemeni, and Georgian. But their new leader, Ahmad al-Jabbar al-Shabar, was seen to be one of the most liberal rulers by the British, and he worked to eliminate the trade. So, by the end of the decade, very few slaves remained. Otherwise, in Bahrain, the British would begin awarding freedom to the slaves who asked for it in the 1930s. And in Jeddah in Saudi Arabia, the British granted freedom to hundreds of runaway slaves who arrived at their consulate from 1926 to 1938. Many of the slaves that were in Saudi Arabia came from Ethiopia or Sudan, but some of these slaves came from as far away as Nigeria. In some cases, they would have even come as pilgrims to Mecca, but were attacked and enslaved by Bedouins, or potentially they sold their own children to cover the expenses of the return trip. Oman, on the other hand, had brought in thousands of slaves from their colonies in Zanzibar, so by the early 20th century, a quarter of the population of Muscat came from Africa. But with the loss of their colonies in Africa, they began to bring in slaves from their other colonies in Baluchistan. These Baluchi slaves began to be imported in larger numbers in the 1920s. Many were in fact kidnapped by other slaves who sought to raise money for their own freedom, or by tribes within Baluchistan looking for money or weapons. So by 1936, 5,000 Baluchi slaves were in the Omani capital or taken nearby Yemen. In the small state of Mukalla, O. H. Little described the Sultan's army in 1925. The Sultan of Mukalla has about 800 slaves. There are about 250 of them in the army, all of African origin. They carry a rifle and ammunition belt, but generally only wear a loincloth and sandals. I never saw them drill, and when they march, each man goes as he pleases. Otherwise, each of these states had their own ideas about slaves. Like in Saudi Arabia, a mixed race person was forbidden from marrying an Arab woman, as there were more concepts of racial purity. But in Kuwait, it was a more common practice, and the children of Ethiopian slaves would go on to rule the country. But leaving Arabia now and going north into the Levant. Here, the French had chased Faisal out of Syria and took full control of the country. But they now had to rule over a state filled with many ethnicities and religions. To try and solve this, they looked at breaking up the country further. Lebanon had already been given their independence, but the Alawites and Druze were also given their own autonomous provinces. Inside the country, though, many still lived a nomadic lifestyle, and the new borders limited their movements. The French also began building roads through their lands, the tribesmen were prevented from carrying arms, and they had to pay taxes on livestock. 
and the influx of Kurds and Armenians changed the demographics, all angering people further. Many exiled nationalist leaders in Cairo did call for a rebellion, but they were often too fractured to do anything. Instead, the main opposition came from the powerful Druze family, al Atrash. In 1922, Sultan al Atrash demanded the release of a man who tried to assassinate the French general Garoul. He even attacked a French convoy in the hopes of freeing the assassin, however this failed and he fled into exile in Jordan. With him gone, the French and many of the local rulers opposed to his family appointed a Frenchman to rule in Jabal al Druze. He was Captain Cabriolet, and he was only expected to serve three months, but he quickly began to disarm the population and use prisoners as forced labour. So Sultan al Atrash returned from exile hoping to have his power restored, but the members of the delegation he sent to the French were arrested. This was enough to call for a revolution in August 1925. Many Druze nomadic groups and nationalist groups like al Fatat then started the Great Syrian Revolt. Sultan al Atrash was made president of the new National Republic, and they quickly defeated the French at Al Masra and ambushed their columns. In Damascus, Abd al Rahman Shah Banda had long organized resistance against the French with his Iron Hand Society. Now, though, he had the opportunity of expanding the revolution east. So he met with Muhammad al Ayash from the Abu Ubayyad clan to spread the rebellion to Daya Azor. Al Ayash agreed, and in June 1925, he ambushed a French convoy. The French responded by bombing their towns and then began to arrest women, determined to bring the rebels out of hiding. The rebels finally agreed to surrender, and in Aleppo, many were executed. There were other rebel leaders, though, like Fawzi al Kawukchi who, despite being Turkic, was an Arab nationalist. He led a revolt in Hama and took control of the city. However, it was quickly bombed, he fled, and the city surrendered. He in fact fled to Gauta, an area of Damascus which had also rebelled under the leadership of Hassan al Karat. al Karat had quite a strange position before the revolt as a Kabadai, a sort of tough man who would settle grievances, defend the neighbourhood from criminals and the likes. Well, he had connections to an early member of al Fatat known as Nasib al-Bakri. Al-Bakri had asked al Karat to join in, and he managed to capture the Azam palace. But again, bombing forced the rebels to retreat. As you can probably guess, this broad spectrum of leaders had their issues, especially out in the countryside. There, Saeed al-As and Ramadan al-Shalash vied for control over a national army. These were both former officers, and in the case of al-Shalash, he managed to gain support among Bedouins and peasants, calling on them to fight against landlords and colonialism. He led this band of fighters around Lebanon until, in his words, plots and tricks forced him to surrender. This was partially due to a dispute with Said al-As, as both accused one another of plundering and extortion. As for the French, to try and stop the revolt from spreading, they promised elections in early 1926 and made promises of eventual self-government. Some did lay down their arms at this news, fracturing the rebels even more. In 1926, French reinforcements began arriving and with an army of 50,000 men, they drove al Atrash to Transjordan and eventually Saudi Arabia. But the other rebel leaders were granted amnesty and French policy in Syria softened as a result. They also found a possible ally in Ahmad Nami, an Arab from a wealthy family in Beirut and son-in-law of Abdul Hamid II. Back in 1920, he entered talks with the French about creating a new Syrian government, but many within his proposed cabinet were either arrested or resigned during the Great Revolt. He continued to try and make some demands regardless, like the incorporation of Lebanon. But he was eventually removed from his position because the French believed he was trying to make himself the king of Syria. He was instead replaced by Taj al-Din al-Hassani, but he again didn't really have much power. The French also tried to create a constitution with Hashim al-Atassi and Ibrahim Hananu, the former rebel leader. But these men just united with many of those granted amnesty to create the National Party, and in 1930, they managed to create a constitution. This led to the creation of the Syrian state. This was followed by talks of independence in the 1930s, hoping to transform the Syrian state into the Syrian Republic. Throughout all of this, Lebanon, or Greater Lebanon, was more peaceful. Here, the French appointed a Maronite called Auguste Adib Pasha to serve as Prime Minister. 
and together they had largely kept control. While over in the British Mandate of Transjordan, Abdullah, Faisal's brother, was proclaimed king. He though now had to try and unite the many tribes who had for decades fought one another. Like right at the beginning of his rule, the Sheikh of Kura refused to surrender his autonomy to the district of Urbid, as he had a long-standing rivalry with the governor. He rebelled and managed to fight back the Jordanian army in 1921, but agreed to surrender when Abdullah personally visited him. Yet the inability of the government to crush such a small rebellion made the local rulers demand some sort of autonomy or just refuse to pay taxes. But more importantly, the Bani Sakia and the Adwan then clashed with one another. These two had a long-standing rivalry. For instance, the Bani Sakia refused to participate in the council in Salt because Adwan members had joined in. Abdullah though depended on the Bani Sakia and their leader Al Fayez to support his claim to the throne and also to hold back the Wahhabis. So rumours began to spread that the king was using Adwan taxes to pay their enemies. The Adwan were also angry with many high-ranking positions in the government being given to foreigners from Syria, Iraq and Palestine. For instance, the first Prime Minister, Rashid Talia, was a Druze from Lebanon, and the third, Ali al rikabi was from Damascus. So Sultan al-Adwan marched on Amman in September 1923, and over in Kura, the Sheikh rose up again. Some intellectuals even sympathised with the rebels, like Mustafa Wabi Tal, a famous poet who was sometimes credited with coming up with the slogan, Jordan for the Jordanians. But the rebel advance on Amman was halted and the British Air Force bombed Kura, forcing the Sheikh to flee his lands. The King, by the way, did have support from some Brits, like Frederick Peake, who led the army. And even St John Philby was there for a while, before going to Saudi Arabia. Many of the actual rebels would flee to Syria, where they were given protection by Sultan al Atrash before the Syrian revolt. Abdullah would eventually pardon most of the men, as he had to deal with other uprisings, like in Wadi Musa in 1926, when they refused to pay taxes. All of this just encouraged him to invest even more into his military to secure his rule. Meanwhile, his brother Faisal, who ruled in Iraq, was following much of the same pattern. He filled his cabinet with Syrians and foreigners, meaning mainly Sunnis were ruling over a population split between different sects. He, however, allegedly said, In Iraq there is still no Iraqi people, but unimaginable masses of human beings, devoid of any patriotic ideal, imbued with religious traditions and absurdities, connected by no common tie, giving ear to evil, prone to anarchy, and perpetually ready to rise against any government whatsoever. This isn't exactly true, as there had been people who had campaigned for an independent Iraq before, but still, he lacked the resources to develop a modern state. Like the core of his army, the Iraqi levies were primarily Assyrians and Kurds, and they were still under British control. Plus, to the north, the Kurds had not really been brought into the new state. Mahmud Barzanji had already rebelled against British rule, but was defeated and exiled to India. In his place, the British put his brother, Sheikh Qadir, in power, as he was seen as more of an ineffective leader. Yet, the British couldn't leave the North in a weak position entirely, as the Turks were beginning to make moves. Shafiq Ali Ozdemir, who began to organise resistance against the French around Gaziantep, now began to move through Persia into Rwanda's, to finally settle the Mosul question. This was one of the main regions outside of the Republic of Turkey that Ataturk sought to secure. There were a few reasons behind this. For starters, the Ottomans had launched Turkification campaigns in northern Iraq, and it was set to become an oil-producing region in the future. Plus, they also feared that Kurdish nationalism could find a base in Iraq and then spread into Turkey. However, Percy Cox believed handing over Mosul would be a betrayal to Faisal. In one report, it said, the severance of Mosul would be a serious economic loss to the Iraqi state. Further, the population of the Vilayet contains a large Christian element, numbering nearly 60,000 in all. These people, it may be taken for granted, would not stay behind to be massacred by the Turks. What the actual demographics of the city and the surrounding lands, though, are pretty hard to get. In this climate, then, Percy Cox thought that Barzanji could stabilise the region, so he brought him back. But Barzanji quickly just declared independence once again. The British, though, at first just accepted his return. As Gertrude Bell wrote, Sheikh Mahmud is just the ordinary type of Kurdish robber baron, only a little more so. We can't stop him, nor yet could any Englishman assume responsibility for what he'll do. But if we could keep on good terms with them, and uphold as far as we can the independence of that bit of Kurdistan which is under him. 
However, in 1923, British officers who went to parley with the Kurds were killed. This forced the British to bomb the Sheikh's position, while also moving in troops north to force the Turks out. They had actually marched north with their Assyrian allies. However, the relationships between the Assyrians and the local Muslims had been worsening for a while. Like in 1923 in Mosul, a couple of Syrian children were killed by Muslims. And in May 1924 in Kirkuk, the Muslims allegedly threatened to attack Assyrian women when the men were being deployed to Suleimania. So the Assyrians returned and massacred their way through the town, killing around 50 people. Meanwhile, to the north, many Kurds actually refused to help Baranji, notably some tribal leaders and some more modern nationalists who rejected his more religious background. So he was eventually exiled again, leaving Faisal to try and incorporate Kurdish lands into Iraq. He however continued to recruit Syrians and Lebanese into his government. They tried to create a sense of Arab unity by, among other things, promoting the Umayyad Caliphate in textbooks. However, their sunny views caused protests and the textbooks were withdrawn in 1927. The Prime Ministers though show what a divided country it was. Abd al-Rahman al-Gilani was a pro-British Sufi from a prominent family. In fact, the British at one point even thought about giving him the throne before Faisal. After him came Abdul Mushin al-Sadun, who came from the Muntafiq Confederation. He actually benefited a great deal through working with the British. Then came al-Asghari, who came from a Kurdish family and early on believed in Iraqi independence rather than Arab unity. And then al-Hashimi, another proponent of Iraqi independence and early leader of the al-Had group. These men would continue to switch leadership through the 1920s, often only ruling for around a year or so. Yet Faisal continued to claim Syria for himself, but still, strangely, he advised the French on what to do during the Great Syrian Revolt. The French didn't necessarily ask for his advice because they wanted it, but it seems that they just wanted to really appease him and stop him becoming a figurehead for the rebellion. And Faisal did achieve some sort of success as in 1926, the League of Nations decided that Mosul should remain part of Iraq, citing Turkish atrocities against Christians and Kurds in the past. Yet, Turkey would receive a percentage of Iraqi oil profits in Mosul for the next 25 years. This would become incredibly important as in 1927 at Baba Gugur, oil was struck. A fountain of it poured into the desert, even threatening nearby cities. The Kurds nearby though continued to push for independence though. Ahmed Barzani and his brother Mullah Mustafa would take up the leadership positions. In some sources, Ahmed Barzani seems to have declared himself a god or some sort of god incarnate on earth. And also the signing of the Anglo-Iraqi Treaty, which gave the British the right to base their troops in the country in times of war. This, by the way, was signed by Nouri al-Said, a local Iraqi whose family came from the Caucasus. This treaty divided the Iraqis into two camps, with those like al-Hashimi favoring a more immediate and full independence. So he formed the Party of National Brotherhood to advance this cause. While in the north, Mahmoud Barzanji returned from exile again and again led a small revolt. He was quickly defeated though, but almost instantly afterwards, the Baranzi brothers led their own rebellion. These rebels were joined by many Kurds fleeing from Turkey after their failed Ararat revolt, and Kurdish rebellions even spread across into Iran with the Jafar Sultan rebellion. Reza Shah, however, quickly crushed the Kurds there and executed many. Inside Iraq, the British joined the government in crushing the Kurdish rebellion, but Mullah Mustafa Barzani would continue to play a role in Kurdish nationalism for the next couple decades, even working alongside the Soviet Union in order to create a state. However, we'll leave Iraq for now and go over to the Palestinian Mandate, where Jews and Muslims continued to clash. The number of Jews there continued to grow, so by 1935, they totaled nearly 27% of the population. This was often as a result of events in Europe, which pushed more Jews to flee to Palestine like massacres in Ukraine during the Russian Civil War. In 1925, a Zionist named Menachem Ushushkin gave a speech demanding a Jewish state without compromises and without concessions, from Dan to Beersheba, from the Great Sea to the desert, including Transjordan. And in 1928, there was a dispute over the Western Wall, 
as the Jews placed a screen nearby to divide genders as they went to pray there. The Muslims appealed to the British to remove it, but the constable who was sent there was accused of using excessive force on the praying Jews. The two sides then began publishing propaganda leaflets, worsening the situation. And the Muslims even began throwing wastewater at praying Jews and driving pack animals through their praying area. Zayev Yabotinsky even began demanding that the whole wall should be restored to the Jews, and there were some who even wanted to rebuild the Great Temple. They formed the Pro Wailing Wall Committee under Joseph Klausner and marched to Jerusalem shouting, The wall is ours. In response, the Supreme Muslim Council also marched on the wall, and in one leaflet they wrote, Rise up against the enemy who violated the honor of Islam and raped the women and murdered the widows and babies. The whole situation then spiraled out of control when a Jewish man was stabbed by an Arab. The British once again had few troops in the city and they did not fire at the Muslims when they killed more Jews at the Jaffa Gate, allegedly not wanting to turn the mob onto them. From here, the violence spread to other cities like Hebron, where the Arabs assaulted Jewish women and killed around 60 people some of which were mutilated. As one Scottish missionary in Safed wrote, women were gashed in the chest, babies were cut on the hands and feet, old people were killed and plundered. The Jews responded by killing Arabs like the Awan family, allegedly disemboweling them and then desecrating the Nebi Akasha Mosque. But there are also many reports of synagogues being desecrated as well. In total, in just six days in late August, 116 Arabs and 133 Jews were killed. Faisal of Iraq told the British to hand Palestine over to his brother, Abdullah of Jordan, and he would make sure that Jewish migrants would be safe. Obviously, this was rejected, and the British mandate would continue to see more violence in the 1930s. Across the border, over in the newly independent Kingdom of Egypt, they were having even more problems. Abdel Kalek Sawat became the new Prime Minister, but he was not liked by everyone, as Britain still held too much influence in the government. Most still supported Saad Saglul and his Wafid party, the leaders of the revolution. But he was still in exile, and the Wafid party refused to enter the new cabinet. Plus, the King Fuad was unwilling to see his powers reduced by the new constitution. In this divided nation, assassinations became commonplace. Even Sawat was nearly assassinated in 1922. And as you'd expect, it's believed that the Wafford party was behind most of them. So Watt responded by banning political meetings and closing down newspapers. And fortunately for him, some in the Wafford party split and formed the Liberal Constitutional Party. This new group tried to reduce the power of the king, so Fawad turned to Saad and the Wafford party, who ultimately decreed that they would serve the nation and the king. The king then accused Sawat of working with the deposed monarch, Abbas II, and forced him to resign. Nassim Pasha was brought in, and many of the articles in the constitution that limited the king's power were just removed. Nassim, however, had inherited another issue, and that was if the constitution would apply to Sudan as well. This, after all, was under joint Anglo-Egyptian administration, and the Egyptians still claimed it. Pressured by Britain, though, they were forced to leave Sudan out of it, and Nassim's government would fall shortly afterwards. In Sudan, the people did begin to demand their own independence, or full unification with Egypt. The Union Association was founded back in 1920, and in 1921, Lieutenant Ali Abid al-Latif and other officers formed the United Tribe Society, aimed at creating a Sudanese nation. He was arrested for a year, but when he came out of prison, he formed the White Flag League, which pledged allegiance to King Fuad of Egypt. He, though, was a former Dinka slave, and, as such, was able to gain a lot of support from the local people. But Sudan at this point was barely a state, as many of their borders were not clearly defined, and the inclusion of regions like Darfur was still debated. The British also tread the north, the south, and Darfur, as distinct entities. For instance, in the south, they replaced Muslim Arabs, who came as slavers originally, with locals in positions of power. In fact, by 1930, they were set on bringing the largely Christian south into British East Africa. Under British rule, though, the country did develop quite a lot, mainly around Khartoum. Like the Gazira scheme was a huge irrigation project that turned deserts into cotton fields. 
Yet then, in 1924, the governor-general of Sudan, Lee Stack, was assassinated in Cairo. Al-Latif was arrested, and the army mutinied in his support. The rebellion, however, was quickly crushed, and Sudanese nationalism didn't really emerge for a while. While all of this was going on, back in Egypt, the British had released Saad Zaglul in 1923, and he quickly won the election with over 90% of the seats in the chamber. He, however, was warned by the British against aiding the rebels in Khartoum, so he quickly stepped down. Then, in the elections of 1925, the king refused to acknowledge the victory of the Wafford party, he dissolved the chamber, and then ruled without a constitution. The politicians that once opposed one another, like Zaglul and Sawat, united to demand an election and the reinstatement of the constitution. They, however, continued to clash, so prime ministers once again continued to change. Sir George Lloyd was appointed High Commissioner of Egypt, and he began to try and negotiate a new treaty with the Egyptians looking to extend the time British troops could remain in the country. But when negotiations were ongoing, Saad Zaglul died, and Mustafa al-Nahas Pasha took over the Wafid party. He would actually rule for a while, but power still changed hands, and the king dismissed parliament once more. Finally, King Fuad found a new group he could trust, the Itihad party. These were conservatives who wanted to uphold traditional Islamic values, and the monarchy. They pushed through a new constitution which granted the king even more power and cracked down on any opponents. So many refer to their leader, Ismail Sidki, as a dictator. The Wafford party therefore continued to argue that with this form of government, true democracy was not available. And with British troops present, neither was revolution. However, in many regards, there were just too many divisions in the Egyptian nationalist movement. For instance, the Wafford party long refused to work effectively with the socialist groups, so Sidki was free to arrest many trade union leaders. Or, in 1931, workers were killed when they went on strike in Bulak. These workers were also suffering because of a huge decline in the economy. Wages reverted back to pre-World War I days, while exports declined by a third. Many therefore turned to the newly founded Muslim Brotherhood, which was created in 1928, by Shaikh Hassan al banna He studied the works of Salafists publishing in Egypt, like Muhib Uddin al-Khatib. He wrote a number of anti-Shia articles, for instance, or Rashid Rida, who now supported Ibn Saud to restore the Caliphate. al banna gained many followers, who all pledged to be soldiers in the call to Islam, and in that is the life for the country, and the honour for the Ummah. While across the border in Libya, the Sunusi order had long kept the Italians confined to the coastal towns. The Italians had offered Idris, the leader of the Sunusi's autonomy over Cyrenica, to secure peace. However, in the 1920s, Mussolini came to power and set to work on pacifying the region. Now here, the Italians used reports of Muslims crucifying their soldiers to justify their actions. Like way back in 1911 at Shah al-Shat, Italians were found hanging from a mosque wall. The Italian press, especially now the fascist press, constantly called for revenge and Mussolini sent in troops. Omar Mukhtar led the Sunusi in resisting throughout the 1920s, while the Italians became more and more brutal. Lands were confiscated, mosques were closed, people were publicly executed, and towns were often bombed or gassed. Rodolfo Graziani earned the title the Butcher of Fersan, and in Cyrenica, he deemed that the civilians could not be separated from the rebels. He was joined by Pietro Badoglio, and they decided to intern huge chunks of the population into concentration camps. As Badoglio said, now the course has been set, and we must carry it out to the end, even if the entire population of Cyrenica must perish. Over 100,000 people, or half of the population of Cyrenica, were forcibly deported. Most of these were women, children, or the elderly, and they were marched through the desert. Any who could not keep up were shot. Once in the south, they were put in concentration camps, where around 40,000 of them died, while as many as 12,000 were executed by the Italian army during this campaign. Omar al-Mukhtar, the leader of the Senussis, was then caught, put in chains, and photographed. This caused uproar across the Islamic world, as he was executed, largely ending the revolt. Idris, though, throughout all of this, was still in exile in Egypt, and didn't get involved. Despite all of this, the Italians managed to negotiate for more land from the British and the French, 
establishing the modern borders of the country. And the Italians also renamed the colony Libya after the old ancient Greek name for the region. Then with the local population depleted, they were free to send over tens of thousands of Italian settlers. In Benghazi and Tripoli, they would make up one third of the population. And as for the entire country, they made up about one tenth. In nearby Tunisia, there was a national movement against the French, but it was somewhat limited. For instance, before the war, there was a month long tram boycott, but it didn't achieve much. And after the war, Abdelaziz Talbi wrote the Tunisian Martyr, which criticized the protectorate and founded the Destor political party. The French then began to target many of their leaders, so the Bey, Mohammed V, threatened to resign in protest. However, in 1922, Lucien Bey, the French resident general, just surrounded his palace with troops and forced him to remain in power. He died anyway that same year, and Mohammed VI took over. He was far more willing to work alongside the French and Talbi decided to leave the country. So there were no strong leaders yet within the national movement. While in Algeria in 1920, after thousands of their people had fought alongside the French in the trenches, they signed a petition. This demanded equal rights, but the French just passed the Jonat Law. This did expand suffrage, but just to around 100,000 people, which angered both the locals and the French settlers. There would be protests because of this and another petition, but nothing else really came of it. Then, in the middle of the 1920s, the ENA was created by Masali Hajj. He had served in the French army and moved to Paris. There, he met communists and anarchists, including his wife, Emile Buscant, who is often credited with making, or at least sewing, the first Algerian flag. They attended anti-colonial meetings like the 1927 Brussels Conference. Interestingly, important figures from across the world actually attended this conference, like Nehru and strangely Einstein. And it also highlighted some of the complications communism brought to the Middle East. For starters, they advocated for independence, but with a message that would not be accepted by many of the religious elements of the countries. And there were communist groups with competing ideas. Notably, Poale Zion, the communist group which supported Zionism, and the new Palestinian Communist Party. Now, the Palestinian Communist Party was not, as you'd expect, an Arab organization. It was mainly Jews who rejected Zionism as a form of British imperialism. The French also banned the Algerian ENA because of their communist affiliations, and the movement never really gained any momentum yet. And by this point, the French had to abandon their idea of assimilating the Kabyle of Algeria. This Kabyle myth was the idea that they, unlike the Arabs, were ancient Christians, and in the words of one French officer, in 100 years, the Kabyles will be French. Eugene Daumas, writing back in the middle of the 19th century, wrote, Beneath the Muslim peel, one finds a Christian seed. We recognize now that the Kabyle people, partly autochthonous, partly German in origin, previously entirely Christian, did not completely transform itself with its new religion. But while it became obvious it wouldn't work in Algeria, they would try to break up the Arabs and Berbers in Morocco, or at least they were accused of doing so. And even Alfred Rosenberg and the Nazis continued this idea that the Berbers were somehow of Germanic stock. On Morocco though, this was once again an open rebellion, and once again the Rif tribes of the north led it. Here, they had long fought against the Spanish, and most reported that few Europeans or even Arabs could travel there safely. But the land was filled with iron, and many within the weak Spanish state were determined to extract it. The fighting in the region had never truly ended though. For instance, there was Moulay Ahmed Ur Raisouni. He, in particular, proved to be a hindrance to Spanish plans. He was an outlaw who often took Europeans as captive and engaged in piracy. Even back in 1904, he captured Ion Perdicaris, and this caused an international incident, as Teddy Roosevelt sent ships to Morocco to demand his release. Then, during the Great War, the French believed that he had ties to the Central Powers and launched raids into his lands. The French also sent Colonel Manuel Fernandez Silvestre to deal with him, but he constantly slipped away. Colonel Silvestre, though, like many Spanish commanders in Morocco, had contempt for the locals. He even reportedly said, the only way to succeed in Morocco is to cut off the heads of all the Moors. Even the French commander, Lyotet, who had fought against the Zion rebels in Morocco, 
criticized the Spanish for their cruelty. Silvestre nevertheless sent troops deep into Riffian lands, but there they ran into Abd el Krim. He had worked with the Spanish as a translator and as a journalist. In fact, he even published articles in favor of Spanish rule and got a job in the Bureau of Native Affairs. But during World War I, he began looking towards Germany, and for this he was arrested until the end of the war. Then, upon his release, he began to seek independence. He united the Riffian tribes, and at Annuel, they ambushed the Spanish. The ill-prepared Spanish conscripts fled when Sylvester shouted, Run, run, the boogeyman is coming. During this complete rout, the Riffians pursued them, and Sylvester allegedly shot himself in the face. In the end, only 1,200 out of 20,000 Spanish survived. And as Krim said, in just one night, Spain supplied us with all the equipment which we needed to carry on a big war. Back in Spain, this humiliation led to the people demanding an end to the monarchy. And in 1923, Miguel Primo de Rivera took power in a coup. However, Spain continued their retreat until in 1924, they only held a couple of coastal towns. They did, however, find a strange ally in Burisani, who had a rivalry with Krim. But the Riffians quickly found the outlaw and killed him. El Krim then turned his forces south and invaded French Morocco. This, though, was a huge mistake. The French sent Patan to organize a combined force of over 200,000 men to land in the north and push the Riffians inland. The Spanish, though, wanting revenge, began to use chemical weapons upon the rebels, even deliberately targeting civilians and the rivers to pollute the water sources. There are also reports of the Spanish mutilating, beheading, and even castrating Riffian prisoners. The newly formed Spanish Legion proved to be particularly brutal in this campaign, and throughout it all, Francisco Franco became the youngest general in the world. He, like many veterans of this war, would form the basis of the far-right movement in Spain and continue to advocate for further campaigns in Africa. El Krim finally surrendered in 1926 and was exiled. But his guerrilla tactics apparently inspired many 20th century figures, including Che Guevara. However, the Moroccan Sultan Yusuf refused to support him, and even moved his capital to Casablanca out of fear that the Riffians would take Fez. Yusuf and his son Mohammed V therefore continued to work alongside the French in the 1920s. However, in 1930, the French set off a wave of nationalist protests with the signing of the Berber Dahir. This was a pretty innocent sounding decree, in essence, allowing the Berbers to rule according to their own traditional laws. Like with the Kabyle myth, they continued to believe that the Berbers and Arabs were different races, and they believed they had to create different laws with the greatest respect possible for Berber customs. However, this was seen as a move to divide the Moroccans and ultimately Christianize the Berbers. This could well have been true in the 19th century, but now it was far more unlikely. Nevertheless, in the mosque, imams called on the people to reject it, pan-Islamists spread propaganda on the issue, and nationalists led protests in Fez. The Pasha there, though, had the leaders of the protests arrested and publicly flogged. While even the Sultan said that the leaders had misled the youth about the largely administrative decree. But even though the protest had ended, the Moroccan nationalist movement only grew from here. 